Welcome to the Friends of Dan Music Podcast. I'm Dan Miles. You've been listening to the music of Ymir Diodato. The track we just heard is called Uncle Funk. It's from an album he released in 1980 called Night Cruiser. Before we get him on the phone, I want to give you a, a quick overview of his career. He became a professional arranger at the age of 17 in his native Brazil. After working with all of the greats in Brazil, he came to the United States in the late 1960s to do arrangements for some of his Brazilian friends who'd relocated here. And his work soon attracted the attention of Creed Taylor. Creed Taylor hired Diodato to do arrangements for artists like Frank Sinatra and Wes Montgomery. In the early 1970s, he recorded his jazz arrangement of Also Sprague's Zarathustra, the Richard Strauss composition, that was featured so prominently in the science fiction film 2001 A Space Odyssey, which became a top 10 hit and launched a new career for him as an in demand performer. His subsequent releases under his own name attracted the attention of a number of artists who sought him out as a producer and arranger, including Aretha Franklin, Roberta Flack, Cool and the Gang, and in more recent years, Katie Lang and Bjork. As artist, arranger, or producer, he's been involved in over 400 recording projects, 16 of which have sold platinum. He's a multiple Grammy winner, and he's still going strong. It's a real pleasure and honor to have him on our podcast, so here we go. Let's bring him on. Well, joining me on the phone now from his home in upstate New York is Yumir Diodato. Thanks for being on the show. Oh, you're very welcome. I'd like to jump right in, if you don't mind, and talk about your area of expertise, arranging. Have there been any situations where you heard something in your head that you couldn't translate to the paper? Yeah, when there are mosquitoes I hear in my head. (laughs) (laughs) And that's difficult to write, I'm telling you. (laughs) I tried. It didn't work. You had a situation where you were satisfied with your arrangement, but you were dissatisfied with how the musicians executed it? Uh, yeah, that's a pretty common thing, you know. Uh-huh. <laughs> but I, I, I usually pursue it. I don't just uh, accept things. Uh-huh. Uh, if it's not right, I like to make it make it right. And, um, and then we discuss. But the thing about hearing in my, 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 my head, yeah, of course, that's how an arrangement goes. You know, it's, it's actually, it's not that I hear in my head. It's just some, some kind of... Uh, it's a hard thing to explain, but uh, you know, the uh, in my case, I not that I like pressure, but uh, I somehow uh, the ideas don't come not until the last moment, and then no matter what I write, and I think it's always a piece of crap. Sorry for the expression, but it's uh, and it turns out it wasn't. It, it worked out okay. It worked out of some miracle. I don't know. It's just maybe because I did so many arrangements. You know, it's mm-hmm. just all in the subconscious, and I. I cannot change that. This is the way it works out. And I don't really hear it. I just uh, imagine it because uh, most of my writing, is I write most of the time without touching the piano. Hmm. Even though once in a while I have to hear what I'm doing. These days you have nice programs such as Sibelius or Finale that play the arrangement as you as you enter it in Finale. I, don't like to do arrangements on the computer, but I like to write them beforehand and then they enter into the computer. Mm-hmm. And then I do some some repairs, some changes. It's amazing because you really, when you write an arrangement, sometimes you think um, everything's cool, but then when you put it on the computer, you see that there's nothing uh, uh, really that, that that makes you think that you what you did is going to stay. You, you should revise it. Mm-hmm. But you can do it in their home. You don't have to do it in the studio. Are there any uh, particular instruments or sections that you particularly like to write for, or do you just think of everything as an equal part that's integral to the whole? No, my favorite is strings, string okay. sections. I love strings. Huh. Uh, yeah, I was a big fan of Ravel. Mm-hmm. Maurice Ravel, French um, composer and, and arranger, is fantastic arranger. He did such a big job on... Uh, on uh, Modesto Mussorgsky, uh, pictures at, at an exhibition, because Mussorgsky always wrote on the piano, and it's in- incredible. When you hear the piece on the piano, and then you hear the piece on the orchestra, it's it's, just, it's unbelievable what Ravel did. I say, you said, oh, how? He had these ideas based on just on a, on a piano piece, which is, uh, Mussorgsky is, is kind of a, a strange writer, you know? Mm-hmm. And he translated it so very well, and gave him to gave uh, his his whole, own, uh, how do you say, interpretation of the whole piece, which in those days was kind of 
uh, very risky if you if you miss the boat they will kill you you finish your <laughs> career will be finished mm. but then uh, you know Ravel was so, such a professional professional guy in Brazil there was a, a string orchestra that I used all the time I never noticed there's um, one of the, the top violin players was married to a viola player which is there are trillions of jokes about viola players mm -hmm. they always they get the blunt of everything <laughs> they, they consider dumb blah 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 that kind of stuff because <laughs> um, the viola is really a, 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 a hybrid a hybrid instrument because it's a between it's an in between a bed in between violin and cello mm -hmm. you don't make it. Um, it it's a kind of a dull sounding um, lower violin, a little chubbier violin, but it really doesn't doesn't make it. So there's a lot of jokes, and this these people came to one of the sessions, and uh, this guy was married to this lady, and she was quietly sitting there playing her viola. I thought, but I noticed her left hand was actually muffling the string, and she kept her eyes on the the guys next to her to see how they were using the bow up or down. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and she was just following them. I said, well, there's something funny here. And I started asking, oh, let me hear just the two cellos. And I said, oh, great. Let me hear, and then I skipped to the violin. Let me hear the, the, the first four violins. And they played. Let me hear the second violins. And they played. Let me hear the violas. And they played. And I said, well, let me hear the violas B. That was her. <laughs> And she started panicking. And she tried to play, but it was it was horrible. So I didn't say anything, but I just want to make sure that they understand that I knew what was going on. Right. She uh, she was trying to hide out in the size of the orchestra. Yeah, I yeah, guess. Well, of course, it's an extra <laughs> money. You know, it helps them pay the rent I, or something. Like that. <laughs> but you know, why at my expense? Because you know? I need the, the viola. Instead of one viola playing the note, there should be two violas. Well, I don't want to offend viola players out there, but I have to confess, if I was going to get interested in strings, it would be the cello or the violin long before, maybe even the bass, long before it would be the viola. Yeah, but the viola has, uh, strangely enough, the viola has a very serious function. And, and, and the thing because, you know, the violin, uh, less, the less note of the violin is a, is a G. It's, to me, is a mystery why they never finished, um, added a C mm -hmm. a string on the violin. Of course, it's, it's sacri sacrilege to do that. So that was not never done. So then they created the viola, which is not necessarily anything to talk about. You know, that's, <laughs> that's the situation. That was their compromise. Because what you gain with the viola is an extra five notes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hadn't thought about it, but that's absolutely right. Um, I was going to say uh, Duke Ellington used to write parts with specific players in mind. Have you ever done that, or do you just write yeah, parts? Of course, of yeah. course, because you, if you heard the person before, or, or knows at least at least a little bit of his work. You know what he's capable of, mm -hmm. and you write certain things. Not when you're writing just regular parts, but when you're writing like solos, or, mm -hmm. and you take advantage of uh, the keys, and you give him certain specific spots, and uh, let him do his job. You know, so such a guy like that was Michael Brecker. He was very good for that. Yeah, he was very good. There was a, a, an understanding, you know, between the arranger and, and him and the conductor or whatever. He was a very, very, very sophisticated player. He, he could do, he could play very well. It's it's logical to to do that, but I'm just wondering if there's a situation where you do an arrangement and you don't know who's going to play it. But I guess that there's, it hasn't been an issue. No, yes, it is an issue. Yeah, you. Uh, I don't know. Uh, the the bottom line is it's got to sound right, you know. So you want to make sure that if you don't know who the players are, you ask for enough time to rehearse. I go through that all the time. I do a lot of concerts, and I uh, work with people I never worked before in my life. Um, I just did this in um, Hamburg, in Germany. Mm -hmm. It was uh, a band. The problem is the band that they were involved in so many different uh, events during this festival. It's a big festival that um, I never had to have got to have a decent rehearsal with them because some of the guys could not come. Um, so I end up rehearsing with, without the main guys. Uh, now imagine me rehearsing a band without the drums or <laughs> percussion. That's what happened to me the first day. Yeah. Um, 
but again, you know, and then on, on, on the day of the sound check, which was uh, it was supposed to be a rehearsal, that they, they never let me even rehearse. So there's a sound check, you don't need to rehearse. I said, well, I never did rehearse. I was hoping to rehearse today. And there was a bunch of crap going down. <laughs> I got very upset and I got very uh, uptight about the whole thing. And I told the musicians, I think what Hamburg needs is more good musicians. I didn't say good musicians, it's more good musicians because they, they had the monopoly of uh, musicianship on the town. This is a beautiful city, Hamburg, amazingly mm. nice. And these are not bad musicians, but they, they took a, a very, uh, how do you say, uh, uncaring attitude about the my stuff. That's unfortunate. Well, let's uh, listen to another of your arrangements. This is from the 1978 Love Island album. It's uh, one of Duke Ellington's signature tunes. What I like about this arrangement is how relaxed you are about introducing the theme. And you really take your time. Let's uh, listen to it and we'll talk about it afterwards. It's a really nice touch having the band imitate a train whistle. Of course, that's uh, the great Billy Strayhorn composition, Take the A-Train. Do you remember why you decided to work up a version of that song? I think it's a great song, number one, and I always wanted to do something with it. When I recorded it, uh, originally the track, um, I had no idea what I was going to do on top of it as far as the arrangement. I, but I had a, just a some kind of a guideline to what had to be done on the chords, of course. And after, way after I finished that in California, I ended up doing the, the horns in uh, New York. But it was, was a simple, simple concept. Uh, and it was kind of a little uh, samba-ish, kind of a bossa nova-ish uh, feel. Yeah, it sounds kind of classy to me. <laughs> sounds sounds kind of like Duke Ellington meets Earth, Wind & Fire, kind of. A <laughs> <laughs> That's right. When I think of a project, I always think of different formations. I never try, I never let it happen... Uh, same formation twice, or even if I do, it's uh, they will be doing different things than the previous. So, uh, one thing I never do, I never I try to avoid listening to my old work. Oh. Past history is past history. Um, it was good or it was not good. I, I mean, I I never had a problem judging my work. I thought my work came out good. I'm happy with it. And um, so that's basically what I had to do. 
when I do a project, to me it's a new thing. I, I don't know what I did before, for whom, why. And if that comes into play into my uh, in my new project, it is just an accident, not, <laughs> not that I do it on purpose. Much has been made of the fact that you're self-taught and have no degree in music, but in the early 60s, did universities even exist in Brazil where you could learn the skills you needed? No, Brazil was the only, there was a Brazilian music conservatory, which is most for classical music. They were never, would never um, take seriously jazz or pop music or anything like that. That I learned by doing. I learned by playing in bands or... Um, doing arrangements, because I started arranging very early. At 17, it was my first job uh, arranging. And uh, it was for a record, too. And I got uh, enthused about the whole thing and started getting more arrangements. To me, it's all the same. I do arrange for an orchestra, a small orchestra, big orchestra, anything. I've done stuff for a trio uh, or uh, flute melodies to symphonic uh, work. Biggest uh, orchestra was the one at the uh, Symphony Orchestra St. Louis. Right. When I did a live concert for a record called the, uh, what's the name of that? Artistry. Artistry, yes, yes. Yeah. And it was uh, Leonard Letkin conducting. That yeah. was some experience. Yeah, that would be a thrill. Well, in your experience, what are the biggest differences between working with Brazilian musicians and American musicians? Language. <laughs> Well, that would be the obvious one, yeah. So apart from that, and no difference in attitude or ability, just language. No, yes, it is, of course it's different. Uh, um, if you have Brazilian musicians play jazz, they they okay, but they miss that light flavor, mm -hmm. uh, the 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 triplet flavor that uh, sometimes they they understand that very well because it's just like a, a speedy waltz feel. Mm -hmm. But it's um, but uh, the opposite's a little more drastic. If you have Brazilian musicians, I mean American musicians playing Brazilian music, you get a couple of them that can do it right, but it, there's a few that don't. For one very bizarre situation is when you talk about the pianists, uh, keyboard players. There are not many that can play with, with a certain flavor. Joe Samp was my favorite to doing that. Um, he has the flavor. He has the hands of his big hands, it, and he has the flavor of doing it. You know. Right. Other than him, there's not many. Uh, even Herbie Hancock, who, who's a friend of mine, he never got that few. You know. he, he can play like oh, he's the best. But as far as Brazilian music, it, it's it's difficult because uh, he would have to live in Brazil a little bit and play maybe in, uh, being out there and at night, you know, with, with the bands and listening and a lot of people did that uh, one of the groups that did that was uh, Urson on Fire uh, I remember when they did the first uh, the first uh, when I brought this record there was really nothing there to talk about but the second record uh, The Way of the World that was a samba mm -hmm. where they sing on top of it in, in, so of course uh, Maurice uh, White is so talented he made sure that the beat did not sound like a samba mm -hmm. And he did many things. We uh, we did many things together too. He played in my record. I played in their record. I did some arrangements for them and their record called um, All in All. And did uh, Maurice White work with you on Tahiti Hut on your album? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Well, the band did. I don't know what he was doing. Maybe he was playing a uh, clavier or something. It was just fun. We just did it for fun. It was no. I think you have complementary styles. Your music and Earth, Wind, and Fire. Is some. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Again, the. Uh, we started working together on different things, but then um, uh, they they were always traveling, and I was always uh, producing in those days. Mm -hmm. And it was never a, a situation. I almost produced uh, uh, the group that Maurice produced, uh, the girls. With the emotions. The emotions, yes. I was mm -hmm. supposed to do that, but I was busy with school and the gang in the studio. There was no mm -hmm. chance. And then I uh, we almost got to the point of thinking of maybe I could do their record too or uh, but Maurice has his very specific ideas for the production I wouldn't touch that to him because he's too good but um, you know it's one thing that I would have loved to do is to, to work with, with them on a more on a deeper level well I'd, I'd like to play another one of your arrangements um, your interpretation of George Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue 
from the 1973 album Diodato 2. And I have to say, it's not only one of my favorite tracks of yours, it's one of my favorite tracks, period, of all time, because it contains all the elements I like best about music, the rhythm, the timeless melody, the fine musicianship. Everybody's just jamming their ass off, so <laughs> it's a lot of fun to listen to. This is Rhapsody in Blue. <laughs> the spot where the the strings seem to come out of nowhere and take over the melody it's very tasty and effective and evocative of the orchestral versions that people are accustomed to hearing and there again was it like take the a train you just said this is a great piece of music let's let's see what we can do with it exactly well it was a uh, rhapsody and blues a little different uh i had to do a second record follow-up record to the 2001 record and obviously everybody uh, flooded me with ideas for which classical music I should do. Mm-hmm. But not all of them lend themselves to a a, a little funk a feel or funk ideas. <clears throat> and I was fooling around with it, and uh, Rhapsody in Blue was in, uh, was in F. And I came up with a couple of lines that served as the introduction, and, and they turned out to be like a, a quote-unquote funky uh, rendition of some of the lines. If you see, I, I modified all the lines. You take a... Uh, how to say that? Uh, little lines here and there, and I made that into um, uh, sort of funk lines, and then the rest is history, because... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Stanley Clark uh, had a you know had a feast with the whole thing. He can play anything, and he understood the whole concept. And then Billy Cobham uh, complemented it by by surrounding everything with mm-hmm. his feels and, and and his ideas, you know, and his tempo was incredible. That's what I'm saying. When you listen to that recording, you can tell Billy Cobham and Stanley Clark. You can tell it's really, really, really great players. <laughs> 